Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and I'm here today at the West Shore Sportsman's Association I'm on the rifle range. And what we're going to do today is we're going to sight in a flintlock rifle. Apologize right off the bat. Some of the things in this video were not even up to you know my <laughs> pretty relaxed standards, uh, but my original plan was not to put this on the channel. I was really shooting this uh, because I was working on a, an article for American Frontiersman uh, on sighting in rifles, and I had recently bought a Canon M6 camera. And I decided to test it out on video before using it at an event, an 18th century event, in a couple of weeks. So I was really shooting this as a test, just for my own use. But, um, you know, a couple of people asked me if I would put it up because uh, they thought it might be valuable to folks. So, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. So I've tried to polish it up a bit, and I hope it works for you. So today I'm going to be sighting in this early Bucks County rifle. It's a 50 caliber flintlock and it was built for me about six years ago by Dave Crispin. And uh, this is one of my hunting rifles. It's important that you understand how the rifle's shooting, not how you're shooting. And um, you can't do that if you're shooting offhand. So I always start from the bench with a good support. Over the years, I've put together a whole kit for sighting in muzzleloaders at the range. And the center of that is this vise that I clamp to the bench. And then, of course, is a set of files, a ball-peen hammer, some punches, some duct tape, and some diamond hones. And that's what it takes. Uh, there are times when I wish that... Um, Flintlocks could grow micrometer adjustable sights while you're sighting in and then you could say hocus pocus and the buttons would magically disappear and you'd be left with primitive sights that are set right where you need them. But unfortunately that doesn't happen. So to get sighted in it's a matter of pounding and filing. I've seen that rifle before. You know Dave Crispin made it for me I'm going to say five years ago, six years ago. Uh, and it's a great rifle. So why am I sighting it in again? And the answer is because I've changed the powder I'm using in all my rifles from Go-X to Swiss. Swiss gives more velocity, higher velocity, more consistent velocity, and it fouls way less. And it's just an all-around better powder, even though it's more expensive. So, uh, changing over means I've got to sight everything back in again. And here's the Swiss. And I know uh, <laughs> it's an old Go-X can. I, I rehouse all of my powder in these old Go-X cans now because everything comes in these crappy plastic containers. It doesn't matter whose powder it is, Swiss, Go-X, Schutzen, Graphs, you name it. They all come in these plastic containers. So uh, I've saved just a ton of old metal Go-X containers. And I decant all of my powder into the metal containers for actual use out in the field. I've been using these containers forever because this lid right, fits, uh, fits these old metal screw caps. They, they make them now that fit the plastic containers. But I got this. I like it. I saved a ton of these metal containers. I used to use them for photo props. Uh, now I put powder in them for the range. So there it is. So here's the deal. With Go-X uh, that rifle shot a 75 grain charge of 3F. So what I like to do is find the powder charge that a rifle shoots the best. And it doesn't matter if it's heavy or if it's light. I know some people like to shoot targets with light loads and then they go to heavy loads for hunting. I try to find the most accurate load, whatever it is. And I use that for everything. Now this rifle is really strictly a hunting rifle for me. So I'm going to sight it in at 100 yards. And typically for my target rifles, I sight them in at 25 yards. But I'm going to sight this in at 100. But the one thing I do, whether I'm going to sight it in at 100 yards or 25 yards or 200 yards, is I do my load development at 100 yards. Because if you do your load development at 25 yards, everything shoots good. 
uh, you really can't tell the difference until you get out to 50 yards, especially 100 yards. A gun that shoots a tight group at 100 yards, it'll shoot a tight group at 25 yards too. And it'll shoot as tight a group as you're likely to get at 200 yards. So I always try to see where a gun, where a gun groups, how it groups at 100 yards. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to shoot a variety of different powder charges, five shots each. And I'm going to start with 65 grains and then I'm going to work my way up until groups get crappy. And I'm going to see which, uh, which powder charge shoots the tightest groups. And if I've got a couple that are close, I'll do a shoot off. Uh, and I'll probably wait until I pick the best load before I do any sight movement. Uh, but I might do windage sooner if I find that the windage is off because that's not going to change much with, uh, with powder charge. So here we go. Let's get loaded up. Okay, so let's start the loading procedure. Like I said, I'm going to start loading with 65 grains of the Swiss 3F. So pour a measure full. Powder. The greased patch. Ball. Just going to get it started. Cold weather makes that patch loop a little bit tough. Okay, send it down. And I like to prick the vent. Make sure it's clear. Alright, now all we gotta do is Prime it and shoot. Okay, so with 60 grains, that's a 7 inch group. That That is pretty awful. Okay, let's have a go with uh, 70 grains of Swiss 3F powder now. Okay, so we did a little bit better. Here's the 70 grain group which is four inches as compared to the 65 grain group. So definitely going in the direction we want, but we're not there yet. Well, let's see how we do with 75 grains. All right, so that was another seven inch group. Not, uh, not very good with 75 grains. All right, we'll go up to an 80 grain powder charge. Well, at 80, at 80 grains for the powder charge, this is looking a bit more like it. This shot was my first shot, and I had just cleaned the barrel. So my next four grouped in here. In fact, my next three were there, and I probably pulled that one low myself. So that's a, uh, a two and a half inch group. Uh, actually, two and three quarters measured this way. It's, it's only about a one and three quarter inch group measured that way. So we're kind of getting there. I'm going to jump up to 90 and see what that does uh, and see if it gets any better. Well, before going to 90 grains of powder, there's no doubt that I've been shooting consistently to the left of center. So I'm going to address uh, windage before going to 90. So I'm hitting low and to the left, so I'm going to adjust that by uh, tapping my rear sight a bit to the right. shot pretty well. Uh, the wind is starting to pick up. we got a storm front moving in. So if it gets to be problematic uh, for sighting in, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Okay, well, 80 and 90 are running very similar performance. Uh, 
I adjusted my rear sight a bit for windage. That's right on. I'm gonna adjust it for elevation now. And I think I'm gonna drop back to the 80 grain group and try that. Now I'm taking a six o'clock hold. So where I wanna print is right here. And I'm using a six o'clock hold because it's, uh, it gives a better aiming point offhand at this distance than trying to take a center hold does. So let's go see how we do. Okay, the windage, the windage adjustment we did worked out just great. Uh, unusually great. Uh, usually you're, you go a little too far and you got to come back and uh, that was once and done. It was fantastic. So now we've got to adjust elevation. And I always adjust windage before I adjust elevation. And I always get windage right before I monkey with elevation unless I'm not even on the paper. If I'm not even on the paper, then then I'll monkey with elevation to to get the groups where I can see them. But otherwise, set windage first. It's the hardest thing to set. And you don't want your windage adjustment to be monkeying with your elevation adjustment, right? So do one thing at a time. Now, the way I'm going to adjust elevation is I'm going to file this front sight down. And... Uh, so we're lucky it's hitting low when you're hitting low you file the front sight lower and that raises the barrel up if we we're hitting high i'd have to file the rear sight down or put a higher front sight on the, those are the only choices and that's not nearly as much fun so you want to start off with a higher front sight than you need and file it down instead of having to, to monkey around with the uh with filing the rear sight so i'm going to file this down i'm not going to file it down much because you don't it doesn't take that many file strokes uh, to change your point of impact at 100 yards. So it's kind of a lesson, lesson learned the hard way, and you don't want to go too far. So I'm just going to start taking this down. All right, so I did 10 strokes on that. And now I'm going to use these diamond hones, and right, I get these from Brownells, and I'm going to just smooth, smooth those file marks out, give me a nice smooth surface again. takes a little bit of a while and you can see I've got this gorilla uh, duct tape on so I don't scar my barrel with the files or the hones so that would be a bad thing okay so that is looking good. I'm going to take the wire edges off of the side until they feel right. Okay, so I got three different levels of hones. That's the coarse one. So I'm going to do the medium and the fine, and then I'm going to go shoot it. Okay, we're on our second elevation adjustment now. 10 licks with the file, moved it, but not nearly enough. And, and that's good because you don't want to go too far. So based on what, what it did move with 10, I did 15, which probably still won't be enough. Uh, but get me more in the ballpark and then I can, uh, I can fine tune it. Okay, this is one of those areas where I would have done something different if I'd really been planning on making a video of this. I don't have a picture of the final targets, but uh, what I do have is me shooting at a 100-yard piece of steel, which is very difficult to see in this picture, so here it is enhanced. So I'm going to shoot at this from the bench, and then I'm going to shoot at it offhand. Now, one of the things I just need to tell you is that my camera's microphone did not do a good job of picking up the ding at all. Uh, but I will show you the results on the steel plate later, and I'm going to try to enhance the sound so that you can hear it, but I don't know if I'm going to get it.
That'll work. I think so. Okay, you can't ask for better than that. Two shots, one from the bench, one offhand, both at 100 yards. I think that rifle will do what it needs to do on deer.